Cheryl, professor of biology from UW Green Bay, who specializes in arachnids, but specializes in their connection to birds and their connection to the environment and, co and conservation practices. Got his PhD from University of Georgia. And I'd like to join me in welcoming Dr. Green. You'll have to let me know what, what you think about this. Should I, should I speak up? I, I usually just sort of belt it out. So. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. I'm uh, always happy to come and talk to people about arachnids, about spiders, etc. I, I study spiders in particular, and I have a, a specialty of sheet web spiders. I'll show you a sheet web spider web later on. Um, I, I think that the, the intro is a little bit of an overdone. I, I really am not an expert on on bird arachnid connections. It's just something that I'm interested in. I, I love birds. Don't get me wrong. I love birds. <laughs> but as my wife will attest, um, I'm not a birder. And but I hang out with a lot of birders, and so I'm always trying to convince them that you know spiders are pretty cool too. Maybe not as many people spend a lot of time studying them, but but I want to try to convince you know birders, convince you guys that that spiders are pretty interesting and fairly important and, and worthy of you know, your respect and attention also. Maybe you're not going to trade in your binoculars for a, for a <laughs> magnifying loop or something, but still, you know, if you can maybe think about them when you're out there. So anyway, I'm happy to come here. Um, obviously, I didn't take a state vehicle. I'm, I'm, you know, we've got a travel ban right now. I'm in my own car, but I'm really happy to be here. <clears throat> okay. So first I want to start out with acknowledgments. I have to say I'm going to show you some beautiful photos. I, I didn't take any of them. I, I credit people where I can, but there's, you know, I just went on the internet and got what I, I'm sort of a curator of beautiful images here. I also, I have to say, a lot of the research was done for me by a lot of my colleagues. I posted on an arachnid board about, do you guys know anything interesting about birds and arachnids? And I got all of these great stories and things that I followed up on and picked, picked my favorites to tell you. And, and even an ornithologist, my colleague Bob Howe at UW Green Bay, some of you may, may know Bob Howe. <clears throat> so he, he told me a little bit about what he knew, knows about birds and spiders too. Okay, so what I want to do today, first very quickly I want to kind of show you how these two lineages of animals are kind of related to each other, right? They're, di they're very different from each other, but they do have a little bit of connection. And then once we're on the same page there, I want to spend a little bit of time with some beautiful photos and showing you basically why I think birds and spiders are actually kind of similar in many ways. Okay? Ten reasons. And then I'm going to finish up by talking about some of the connections between birds and arachnids. And I'm going to spread it out to not just spiders, but other arachnids too, as I'll explain, because actually some mites have some really interesting relationships with birds. Okay? So, Let's get started. Um, we've got these two lineages, and both of them are very clearly, you know, all of the birds are related to each other, all of the spiders are related to each other, very clearly natural groups. Um, and of course, they're both animals. We're animals, right? One big group here. And in fact, we're all in a subgroup of animals, the, the bilaterally symmetrical animals, which are most, most animals, right? But after that, uh, birds and spiders kind of, kind of diverge. So let's look at the birds first. This is kind of the groups that birds are in. Starting at the very top, we and birds are deuterostomes. That's the kind of animal that we are. Um, our, the very first hole in the embryonic body turns into the anus in these. And so we share that with birds. We're in the same phylum, the chordates, and we're also in the same subphylum. We're vertebrates, of course. Uh, we're also terrestrial vertebrates, of course, the amniotes. But there's where we, where we part ways with the birds. The birds are actually reptiles. I'm sure you've heard about this sort of thing. So they're actually in this group, the diapsida, with, with other reptiles. And interestingly, birds are now thought to be really in the same clade as dinosaurs. So really, birds are dinosaurs that didn't go extinct, except, of course, they're very specialized in having feathers and, and flying. So they're in their own class, class 80. So there's the birds. And then we have the arachnids. And the arachnids are in a completely different group, the protostomes. They're the first hole in the embryo of a protostome turns into the mouth those animals instead of the animals. So very different. Uh, of course, they're arthropods. They've got an exoskeleton, right, and jointed appendages. And some of the arthropods are the arachnids, right? Not the insects, not the crustaceans, but the, 
the arachnids, and there's actually 11 different orders of arachnids. And um, I'm going to talk about um, these four here, three of which occur in Wisconsin, and then there's the scorpions, right? So spiders, mites, and pseudoscorpions. If you don't know what those are, I'll show you a picture. And then scorpions, the real scorpions. I'll talk a little bit about those, too. So, so spiders are an order. Um, the birds are a class. But you know, with vertebrates, this big class of birds is probably about the same size as an order for a vertebrate. There's so many more invertebrates that you have a different standard, right? Okay, so that's, those are the two groups we're interested in. And then you're probably wondering about this. Why, why in the world would somebody devote their lives to studying spiders when there's birds to study? <laughs> I mean, spiders are okay and all, but why wouldn't you study birds? So let me try to explain to you why I'm an arachnologist instead of an ornithologist. As much as I think birds are pretty awesome, first of all, <laughs> I, I am extremely nearsighted. And although my glasses correct my vision pretty well, I really cannot see. You know, I'm always the last person. You know, oh, it's up there. You know, right there. And I'm like, what? I can never see it. It's a little gray blob. So I just would not make a good bird. I try, but I just wouldn't make a good bird. Um, here's another reason. You know, there's a lot of spiders. People aren't as interested in them in, in general. And so they're actually a lot less known about spiders than there is about birds. And, and especially if you look at your average bird species versus your average spider species. And so that makes them interesting for a scientist to study. There's a lot of new things. I find spiders all the time. I found dozens of them. Species that I find in Wisconsin that no one has ever found in Wisconsin before. Can you imagine finding a bird that you know, no one's ever found in Wisconsin? Well, that's kind of a big deal. I found like 25 of them so far. So there's a lot to you know discover, and then of course there is there are two or three ornithologists for every species of bird on the planet. <laughs> Whereas there are 20 or 30 spiders for every arachnologist. So you know, I've got my, most of my own family you know to work with all to myself. So that's that's good too if you're a scientist trying to carve out a little niche for yourself. The arachnologists are really friendly with each other because we're not competing really. Um, and then I, I guess I would say that spiders are pretty cool too, as I hope to convince you. So they're, they're quite interesting, and you can spend a whole lifetime learning about them too. Okay, so I want to talk about first some similarities between birds and spiders. I'm going to give you ten different things that I think are similar between the two groups. And this is the first one. Both groups are really ancient. They're quite diverse in terms of numbers of species. And, and they're very successful in that they live all over the place, and they're a big part of biodiversity. So I'll start with the birds. Um, they, they've been around since you know the age of the dinosaurs, since sometime in the Jurassic period, 160 million years or so. Um, there's about 10,000 species of birds described, and that's about how many birds there are, right? You know, there's not a lot of unknown birds out there, but there are a few. Um, and that's actually pretty good for vertebrates. That's a pretty big group, the largest group of the four-legged vertebrates. Are birds. So there's about 9,000 of these squamates, the lizards and snakes, and there's only 5,500 mammals. So it's a much bigger group than, than mammals. So that's pretty good for a vertebrate. It's, it's quite an interesting and successful group. Um, the spiders are older and more diverse. That's, that is very true. So they actually immerse some of the first land animals all the way back in the Paleozoic. They call this the age of the fishes, but it's the age of spiders too, right? So 386 million years ago or so. Um, and there's well over, we've, we've described over 40,000, so about four times more spiders than birds. But we've probably only described about half of the species of spiders. It's pretty easy. I found many species of spiders down in Panama, too, that are unknown as far as I can tell. So there's a lot of unknown ones. So it's a big group. Um, and it's the actually the seventh largest, in terms of numbers of species, order of animals. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of insects that are more diverse, like, you know, beetles and wasps and butterflies and flies, but then there's also the mites. There's more mites than there are spiders. After that, though, spiders are the biggest group. And spiders are the biggest group of animals that are, consist entirely of predators. Right? There's others, like the dragonflies and damselflies are all predators, but there's still a lot more spiders than there are. Dragonflies and damselflies are bears or something like that. Okay, so that's one. Here's number two. Both lineages of animals are very heterogeneous. That means 
the, the, the different birds look very different from each other. It's just amazing how many different weird kinds of birds there are. And same with the spiders. So here's just a, a smattering of some of my favorite different kinds of birds, right? And it's just amazing. I mean, this thing is like a like an insect, right? It's incredible how tiny it is, and, and it's so active, and it just doesn't seem much like the other birds. And then, the, the, if you count the extinct ones, this is um, a ty uh, Titanus, I think it's called. Um, it lived in Central America about 13 million years ago. So fortunately, it was before humans because it can eat us. <laughs> question is three meters tall, three meters tall, flightless predator. Um, so recently extinct, just 13 million years. And then, of course, weird things like, how can you hit your head against the tree? It's amazing. It's amazing that they can do that. And, you know, this incredibly fast flying, you know, raptors. And then my own personal favorite of the penguins, that's a weird one that you've heard of. And think about what they do and where they do it and the fact that they're birds. How can they do that? It's amazing. And really, you could say the same thing about spiders. They're not as familiar to us as most people think. Oh, they're all small and brown. But they actually vary as much in size as birds do. Right? So here's the big, one of the biggest spiders, right? This big tarantula is much bigger than this person's hand. And then the smallest spiders, this thing is about one millimeter in length. And so that's, this thing um, weighs about 10,000 times less than this one. So it's about the same as between a hummingbird and an ostrich, really. Um, it's a similar sort of a thing. This is a really interesting animal. Look at the big, long jaws. And then it closes its jaws on this little insect here. It's the, one of the fastest movements of any animal. It, it, it closes like a mouse trap. It doesn't use muscles. It uses stored energy inside this cuticle. Um, and then, of course, there's even some that are kind of cute. Isn't that sort of kind of cute? It's got these big eyes, and it's fuzzy, and it's diurnal like us. It hangs out in the daytime. It's interested in what you're doing. If you wiggle your finger, it'll jump on it. It won't bite you. They're really pretty cute. And then there's some that are, they live in webs, and they're mostly Mind, and they're just very alien to us and really weird. And then look at this one. You're saying, no, oh, that's not a spider, that's an ant. But it's really just a spider that's trying to be an ant, right? <laughs> and it looks like it has three body parts. There's the head, thorax, abdomen, the pair of antennae, there's the six legs. But actually, all of this stuff is the front leg, right? So you can see that's the, that's the cephalothorax, that's the abdomen, and then this is the first pair of legs and it's got little tufts of hair here that it puts together and makes a head. And then it's got the ends of its legs, it carries them like antennae. It doesn't walk with those, it just hangs them out like this. And it's just totally mimicking an ant in a really beautiful way. Want me to cut the rest of the legs with each? Uh, yeah, maybe so. I'll do it. Sure. Yeah, that's that good? better. That seems fine to me. Is that good? That's better. Okay, great. So you get a good look at those. Wow. Cool stuff. Number three. Both lineages have managed to go in almost everywhere that, that you can imagine them going across the planet, right? Obviously, these are terrestrial organisms, and there's not as many of them in the ocean, right? But, but other than that, you know, in terms of terrestrial and semi-terrestrial habitats, both birds and spiders are found in the wettest, the driest, the highest, the hottest, the coldest environments that, that there is on Earth. So they're both very impressive in that way. And I want to point out two, two lineages here that I think are particularly impressive. I mentioned that I think that penguins are just really awesome, you know, they, they live on land at least some of the time, but of course they're foraging in the ocean. But you know, an, an Antarctic uh, vertebrate is quite rare, and of course they become oceanic and they swim around and catch fish, it's amazing. Um, there, there are no birds that live full time on, in Antarctica, there's just not enough food. There's no spiders either, it's so harsh there's no spiders there, but there are mites that live in Antarctica. So that's, if you want to think about the arachnids. Um, and then I want to talk about the, this high altitude record. Spiders hold a high altitude record most people aren't aware of. The, the highest found animal, you know, multicellular animal we've ever found is on the slopes of Mount Everest. At 6,700 meters, it's 22,000 feet. It's a permanent resident there. And you're thinking, well, what does it eat? There's, it's the highest one. Well, a lot of dead insects blow up onto the mountain, you know, with winds and stuff. And it mostly just scavenges like dead bugs. You know, maybe it eats gork from the mountain climb. <laughs> um, so, the, you know, the highest mammal is only 19,000 feet, so it's way above where yaks can live. It's got a cool name. This is the Euophrys, which we have some of those in Wisconsin. But this is the Euophrys omnisupersties, which means 
It lives above all. <laughs> but yeah, it doesn't look like it's got, it's got an attitude. And then I want to point out that horse birds also are really good at being very high. And they have much better lungs than we do. They can breathe where we can't breathe. And they actually have located a, a vulture at 11,000 meters, which is in a few minutes would be fatal for a human. They're just hanging out there. And of course, they can glide, so it's not fair, but it's pretty impressive. So both are impressive that way. And hey, look, here's even some underwater ones. Of course, I showed you some penguins already. But I, when I was a kid, I saw a dipper in the Rocky Mountains. And, and it was a life-changing experience for me. I was like, what? I couldn't even tell my dad because I thought I was insane. I was like, I saw a bird, and it was walking underwater in the stream <laughs> in the mountains. So that's pretty amazing. And I think the first time people see these water spiders, they think the same thing. This is a big old spider. And it, and it makes a web underwater, and then it fills it up with bubbles it carries from above. It makes a little diving bell in there. And then it catches stuff underwater, and goes into its little diving bell where it's safe from land predators and fish, and it just hangs out over there underwater. Isn't that amazing? It's too bad we don't have those in Wisconsin. So it's only in uh, Europe and Asia. Okay. Number four. Both lineages, of course, are ecologically important. It's hard to demonstrate that with a picture, but, but this is a, a, a little pie graph that shows the biomass, the weight of all the animals in one of the most diverse rainforests on the whole planet. This is in Tambopata in Peru. So these scientists got together and they figured out the biomass of all the animals. And of course, it's, it's mostly insects. Look at that, look at all these. This is 24% of the rainforest animals is just ants and termites. So, you know, the arachnids are kind of pale in comparison to that. But, look at the birds, there's a little slice, there's the arachnids, they're, they're not bad compared to mammals, uh, reptiles, amphibians. So they, they, they're almost always some of the most abundant predators on, um, in most ecosystems, and so of course they're important, <clears throat> ecologically. Of course, it's also true that these are two lineages that are very culturally significant. Everybody knows about birds and spiders, and they have real meaning to people of all, all kinds. I could spend you know, a semester on this, but let me just show you two pictures that kind of sum this up. And I have to say that birds and spiders have a very different reputation. Don't they? <laughs> birds, birds are awesome. Spiders, spiders are horrible, repulsive things for many people. Um, so they have a much different reputation, but it's still interesting. So here we have you know, the symbol of our country, the bald eagle. I mean, come on, it's a noble animal. It's really awesome. And then you have the spiders. Um, this is one of my favorite images. This is, um, this is from a, a, a sort of a, a now defunct civilization in South America and Peru. It's called the Moche. The Moche lived around the same time as the Inca. And they actually, this is one of the gods they worshipped. Um, it was a really sort of violent religion. They, they worshipped this, this spider-human hybrid called the Decapitator. And they would sacrifice people because the, the decapitator needed blood. Right? But you can see that they, they definitely could see the power in spiders and the fact that they drink blood for a living and stuff. And, um, so, you know, people do have a lot of um, psychological investment in spiders, even though a lot of it is negative. I, I don't really see the negative in spiders, but some people do. But, but I get it. I mean, you know, 10% of all people are sort of arachnophobic. And it's not really, you know, anybody's fault if you're arachnophobic. It's just, you just have to deal with it. Okay. Number six, both lineages are seasonal in our region. Of course, what is isn't seasonal in our region? But, but I think they're both interesting in the same way in that you, you have to be in the right place at the right time to see the right bird or spider. So it's not just birds. Of course, we're really familiar with the seasonality of a lot of our birds, of neotropical migrants that you know, just simply bail in the winter, right? They're, just, they're thousands of miles away right now, and they wish us well. Um, so they can leave, they, they're smart, right? They're smart, they leave with constant wind. Well, spiders don't do that, but what they do is they're, they're like mostly immature for a lot of the year. And, and so they're kind of hidden, and you can't identify them if they're immature, you don't know which ones they are. So this spider is mostly only adults. This is in the southeast, but it's from like about November to April. So mostly in the winter time, you find this spider. That's the only time you can find it. So spiders are that way, just like birds. You have to be in the right time to find the species that you're looking for. Of course, not every spider or every bird, you know, shuns the winter, right? So there are winter active birds here, and they're really interesting. And there's even winter active spiders, right? There actually are spiders that live underneath 
this subnivian layer right underneath this little space that forms due to sublimation of the snow because of the heat of the earth. And it forms this cavity here that keeps these little mammals warm and these plants are photosynthesizing. Well, spiders can be active during the winter and even feed during the winter. Not most of them, but some species. So those are very interesting too. Just like, you know, a ptarmigan is pretty interesting too. Or a, a, a kinglet. Think about that. How do they survive? It's like, it's amazing. It's amazing that birds, a lot of the winter active birds can survive a, you know, a night like this. Right? So the other thing about birds and spiders that I think, you know, you should appreciate is Obviously, birds are really interesting in how mobile they are. You can just, they can just be anywhere. They can colonize new territories. Um, if the habitat's right, they can get there. But actually, it's kind of the same thing as spiders, but it's just a very different way of being mobile. Vagile means how far can they go in their lifetime? It's vagility. It's a similar kind of concept. So uh, again, of course, birds, my, a lot of birds you know, migrate very long distances, really as far as they can go, right? Some of them go between Antarctica and the Arctic. Um, I was amazed to see this map. There's a little national park up here in the, in the Yukon, and there's some bird species that come from Africa to go there. It's incredible, isn't it? You just think of them always just doing this, but some of them do other things. New Zealand, really. So they're, they're all, they are impressive. Um, but spiders are actually impressive in their own way, too. They do not migrate in the way the birds do, of course, in these routine ways. But they are highly mobile because they can balloon. Many of them, not all spiders, but many spiders, most spiders, can balloon at least as babies. They float on rising air currents, you know, with a silk line, and they are really just as mobile as birds. They just can't control it as well, right? Uh, but it doesn't take as much energy either. You will find on the most isolated places on the planet, you will find spiders. They and they recolonize areas after volcanic eruptions first. They're some of the first animals to get there after Mount St. Helens or a new island in the middle of the Pacific you'll find spiders right away. So they're, they're also quite impressive at their ability to colonize new areas, recolonize areas, and et cetera. Okay, here's something that's definitely they have in common. Both of these animal groups build structures, and that makes them interesting, right? We're, that's the other thing you can look at. It's not just the birds. What about the, the bird nests, right? And so, you know, birds make all kinds of interest, mostly nests, although this thing, I, get, I don't think that's a nest, right? That's like a courtship platform that the bowerbird bit, male builds and, and shows off around it, and then they collect blue stuff. Isn't that weird? Isn't that great? It's so cool. And then, of course, more practical, the, the cliff swallows make these really cool, um, very almost permanent structures that they, uh, um, that they live in, even here on the UW Green Bay. They're, they're all over the buildings at UW Green Bay. Um, and then here's some spider things, right? Everyone knows about spider capture webs, right? But of course, there's some spiders that also make little trap doors to hide themselves so they can ambush their prey as they walk by. They're basically like fishing. You know, they've got little lines out, and then insects trip the line, and they know it's there, and they run out and get it. And so that's some structures. This is made of silk, but also dirt and things like that. So it's a structure that the spider makes. It doesn't find that or anything. Um, a couple more of them. I can put these all in one page. So look, the weaver bird, uh, just a really amazing, weird sort of sack-like nest. And then, of course, the bald eagle makes this really impressive, large structure like a human could, you know, sleep on at night if, you, if the bird wasn't there, right? <laughs> if the bird was there, you wouldn't want to do that. Um, and then here's some, some cool spider webs. So this is the sheet web spider. That's a, that's a sheet web, the one of the kinds of spiders that I said. So it's called the filmy dome spider. There's the filmy dome, right? And then this thing, I wish there was a person nearby that, that's about how tall my drain is, right about that. That's about that tall. So this is several square meters of rainforest. It's a, a social spider. It's, it's a couple of hundred spiders that all get together and make one big wedge. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a pretty impressive structure. Maybe not quite as, as, as permanent as this thing, but it's pretty impressive. You don't want to run into it. Um, and sometimes birds can really be almost like a geological force, right? They can, they can change the ecosystem especially these little islands out in the middle of the ocean that they come to nest on. They keep that thing treeless. They change the, the, the structure and function of that ecosystem very profoundly. Um, and there's nothing like that with spiders, I have to admit. But I thought I'd show you kind of a cool, big scale thing with spiders. I'm sure you've at least heard of this before. This is gossamer. Gossamer is the, the accumulation of a bunch of ballooning spiders. They're each making a little bit of webbing. And if there's a whole bunch of spiders that balloon all at the same time, which they do, they balloon on really nice weather in the 
warm air is rising, and they feel warm. And they're all blooming at once, and then this stuff all comes down in mass, and that's gossamer. So this dog is walking in. Okay, number nine. Both lineages have members that are endangered, right? Of course, we're, we're all aware of endangered birds and, of course, extinct birds, and, and, and it's really sad. I've got examples of both lineages from Hawaii, so this is the, the Pauli, and, and it's really sad. This thing might be extinct as we, as we speak. You know, there are just a few of them left. Um, it's critically endangered, and, and it's not alone in being very endangered by a lot of things that humans have done. Well, you know, spiders are not you know, immune to this sort of thing. Either they're smaller, and so they tend to be less vulnerable, but there's a lot of them, and there are many spiders that are endangered and going extinct as well. So this is one, this is on the endangered species list as well. Uh, um, it's sometimes called the Kauai cave wolf spider, because it, it lives on the island of Kauai, and it lives in caves, but, and it's a wolf spider, but this is a better name. It's in a genus called the big-eyed wolf spiders. Most of these spiders have really big eyes, but this one lives in caves, and so it doesn't have any eyes. So it's the no-eyed, big-eyed. <laughs> so that, that's pretty awesome. Um, but it lives in these lava tubes, and these lava tubes are nice and moist, and so there's insects that live there, too. Well, they're pumping water out of Kauai and other Hawaiian islands. There's other species on other islands. And, they're, um, and they're, they're watering golf courses and stuff like that, and the water table is going down below where the lava tubes are, and it gets too dry. And I guess these spiders can't. Number 10, both lineages are beautiful, fascinating groups of animals. And I don't have time to show you these videos, but these are must-see videos. And I'm sure you guys have heard about the peacock spider. It's a jumping spider, but the males have this little flap of skin on their abdomen, and they wave it around and do this little dance. And, and I, I picked these two photos because they both look like faces to humans, right? We just automatically make faces out of these, and that kind of looks like a funny little angry guy with a mustache or something. Uh, but a really beautiful spider. And then look at this thing, a bird of paradise from New Guinea. And the male is, is courting the female. He's got this kind of umbrella made of feathers that just makes him look completely artificial and completely fake. And he's got two blue spots for eyes and a blue smiley face. It's like, what is going on? you got to see the video. It looks fake. It looks like CGI, but it's not. And, and these guys have gone to and found all the 30-some species of uh, birds of paradise. And it's lovely footage. They've got video of all these, all these birds. So go to that Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Okay, so now let's talk about some connections between birds and arachnids. And I'm going to not just talk about spiders now, but also some other arachnids, because for the most part, you know, spiders and birds really haven't formed really tight relationships, like intimate relationships. You know, it's just that sometimes birds eat spiders mostly. That's probably the main, and I'll talk about that. <laughs> Um, but, but there are some really interesting interrelationships between some other arachnids. So I want to look at those first. I'll start with the tightest relationships, and then I'll end with some of my favorite stories that have to do with spiders. Okay. So first, um, let's talk about parasites. This is important for birds. It's not necessarily a happy thing, but all birds are parasitized by mites, and many birds are fed on by ticks, right, the kind of mite. And so they have the same sort of problem we do with, with parasites, and they're not all germs. Some of them are, are animals, some of them are mites. And, and there's mites that live on every bird species. There's no question about that. This just happens to be one that I'm showing you here. This is called scaly leg, and this is the critter that, that causes scaly leg. It just lives in the skin and feeds on you know, the sebaceous material and stuff of the, of the leg, but obviously it, it damages the skin's immune response. And it, this can be obviously um, a, a, a bad thing, right? But they're feeding on blood or something. They can it reduce the fitness of the bird, and of course they can cause immune responses, which are which are harmful to the bird. Um, but you know they control bird populations. They're part of the natural cycle. And when there's too many birds, then these these mites have an easier time spreading, and they they sort of keep the birds in a particular um, uh, population level. And of course, um, mites can also vector a lot of pathogens. Viruses and bacteria and protozoa, and even tape worms can be vectored by mites to from one bird to another. Right? How does the how does the worm get from one bird to another? It's you know something like a mite. Okay, so parasitism is important. I'm not going to show you too many pictures because I know that's not what you want to see. <laughs> okay, 
What about commensalism? I don't know if you've heard about commensalism before. That's when one organism really benefits from a relationship, and the other organism doesn't really care that much. Humans have a good number of commensal relationships, right? These little organisms that live on us, and we don't even know about them, that you know, they couldn't live without us. And so a good example of that, actually, are pseudoscorpions. So these are pseudoscorpions. They, they, they're little tiny. The biggest ones are just about a quarter of an inch long. You know, many of them are microscopic. And they look like scorpions. They're related to scorpions. Right? They're both arachnids. They've got these pincers that they catch food with, just like scorpions. But they don't have the, the stinger at the end. That's why they're called fake scorpions or pseudoscorpions. They don't need the stinger because their, their, um, their palates are venomous. So they can inject venom same thing to grab with. So anyway, there's a lot of these little pseudoscorpions around, and oftentimes you can find them in bird nests. They, they seem to like many species or prefer living in bird nests. There's a, there's a good there's good habitat there, but also there's a lot of little bugs and things in the nest, and they can help eat them. Um, there's not really, I can't find any that are definitely just live in bird nests. So there might be some, but nobody's <coughs> documented that yet. So birds might actually benefit. It might be that these pseudoscorpions might eat some of their lice and fleas and things, but probably most of them don't really care that much one way or another. They probably don't really care. So it might be a commensal relationship. If they really benefit, you think there'd be some that just live with birds. So here's a paper where I found a global checklist of pseudoscorpions found in birds' nests, just published in 2010. Um, and they found the pseudoscorpions, they found 85 species so far in different birds' nests. Birds, they've only found, they've only looked at in 98 bird nests, 98 species. So probably what's going on here is almost any bird nest could have pseudoscorpions in them, but people just aren't really looking. So there's probably way, way more of this going on than, than we really think that there is. Okay. This is a really interesting kind of commensal relationship between birds and arachnids. This is probably the most highly evolved relationship between birds and arachnids going on for millions of years probably. And it might be the pinnacle of bird or arachnid connection here. And they're called feather mites. And I don't know if you've heard about them or not, but every bird you've ever seen has got feather mites. Probably. <laughs> Certainly every bird species that anyone's ever looked at has got at least one species of mite that lives in its feathers. And they, they mostly live in the shafts of the feathers. Many of them get in there and they can't even get out again. Only their babies can get out and they're trapped in there their whole life. And they spend their whole life in there and they mate inside of the shaft of the feather. Um, so there's there are several types on every species of bird that mite people have ever examined. Um, most of these seem to be host specific. So it's not just like one mite that you know goes everywhere. Um, usually they're even specific to a certain feather type on the bird. And so here's the record. There's a parakeet and they had 25 different species of mites of different feather types in its body. Isn't that incredible? When you think about how many birds there are, how many mites there must be. Um, see, is there anything else here? Yeah, this is the good news. In general, they do not cause harm. They're not really a disease state. It's just an animal that lives with, with the birds and don't, doesn't seem to affect them very much. Yeah? What can they find to eat inside the shaft of a feather? <laughs> good question, isn't it? They, they seem to eat this sort of sebaceous that's in the pores of the feather. And they're not very big. They don't eat very much. But yeah, it's amazing. It's a very protected habitat. It's very predictable. And I guess it, it works for them. They're very tiny. Um, this is, these are just some photos of three genera that were found on this one species of Sora, Sora rail. So I just thought I'd show you that. And I've got one more really awesome picture. This is from National Geographic from this year. I don't know if you saw this National Geographic article. It's called Mighty Mites. And so this is 194 times bigger than normal. Of course, this one's even bigger, right? This one's like, like, let's say, 500 times bigger than normal. Um, so this is a feather mite. It's an interesting one. It's got little suction cups on its legs so they can climb on the feather. I think it's beautiful. I mean, it's not like a bird. It's kind of alien, but it's beautiful. It is. It's a beautiful creature. If they were as big as that, they'd be in every zoo, right? Every kid, every kid would know these instead of dinosaurs. Okay, so here's a, this is a neat case of probably commensalism, right, where the mites really benefit from the birds, the birds probably don't care very much, um, and it has to do with these mites that live in flowers in the tropics, 
not every flower, not every mite, but special mites. And, and they live in these flowers, and, and you have to ask, how would they get to another flower, you know, so they could find a mate or even just get to a new patch of flowers? Especially these tropical flowers that tend to last a very short period of time, oftentimes one day, and then the flowers are done. And, and the answer is in the nostril of a hummingbird. This is something that people have studied, discovered, and then studied. Um, and so this is what happens. They, they climb up when the, when the hummingbird is visiting, they climb up the bill, go in the nostril, hide, and then the mite from the nose of the bird can smell if the flower is the right flower. And it's visiting much different flowers. And you know how hummingbirds are. They spend like about two milliseconds at a, <laughs> at a flower and they're gone. So these mites have to make a decision, am I going to leave or am I going to stay? And then they have to act on that in a hurry. And so they are some of the world's fastest animals by body size. Right? I mean, they only go about half a mile an hour. But, but if you think about how they're, they're doing about 12 body lengths per second. And so that's about how fast a cheetah goes when it's sprinting about 12 body lengths per second. So they have to go real fast. So here's, here's some of them. I couldn't find any kid photos online, but, but those are the bird, those are the hummingbird nostril mites. Um, this is an interesting thing. This is a different mite, but these are mites that live around here. They're little predators. And this is maybe the world's fastest land animal by size. Okay, so here's the real speeds. The mite's not very impressive, a half a mile per hour. And then, you know, here's these other things. Humans, Usain Bolt can go 27 miles per hour, she can go 60. But if you did it by, by body lengths, if, if all of these animals were the size of Usain Bolt, he goes 27 miles per hour, the cheetah would be going 99 miles per hour if the cheetah was that big. Um, the mite would be going 1,400 miles. <laughs> Think about that. That's pretty amazing. So that's just a little back of the napkin calculation I found. <laughs> and then here's a picture, in case you're curious, there's the nostril of the hummingbird there. It's a beautiful photo, isn't it? And then I just, ha I just had to show you this, too. This doesn't have to do with the, mite, the mites, but look at, this is a tongue bone of the, of the hummingbird. And it starts on the top of the skull, goes around the skull, on either side of the throat and up through the bottom of the mouth. Now here, here's a really interesting modification of bird's galaxy, tongue bone. Okay, um, competition. Competition might be important. I could not find anything about this. A lot of birds and arachnids eat the same bugs, right? They're eating the same insects, and so you think that sometimes they would compete with each other for food. I can't find anything about this, though, and, and the truth is, really hard to document competition in the field. It's really hard to prove that two organisms are competing with each other unless they're really competing bad. And so I couldn't find anything about this. I don't really know to what extent they compete. It's something to think about. Though. Predation, though, this is something you can find examples of, right? And it, it does go both ways. <laughs> so I'm going to start off with the arachnids eating the birds. Get that out of the way. <laughs> and then we'll go to the birds. <laughs> believe me, believe me, there's there's way more birds eating arachnids than arachnids eating birds. Okay. But this is interesting, at least to me, that sometimes arachnids do eat birds. So first, here's an example of scorpions eating birds. This is probably just a weird, rare thing that happens sort of sporadically. And this is a friend of mine, Lenny Vincent, was in South Africa, and, and he found this big aggregation of these birds, apparently the most abundant bird in the world. I don't know if you know about this thing. The Cleas. Red-billed clea, and, and they're incredibly abundant in Africa. So this is at the Kruger National Park. And, and at this one spot, there was huge numbers of these birds in the trees. And so in 20 square meters, they found eight scorpions in their burrows. How did they find these scorpions? Because there was a dead bird at the, at the bottom of each one. They had captured juvenile cleas um, by their legs, and they just weren't letting go, and then eventually they got succumb to the poison and die, and they're feeding on them. So it probably doesn't happen very often, but it's probably like a bonanza. Look at this picture. I don't know if you can orient yourself to this. Each one of these is a little sparrow-sized bird, I guess. I guess it's sparrow-sized. It looks like a little sparrow to me. Anyway. Yeah. Just huge numbers of these things resting in this tree. And so this was this is the actual tree. This, these are actually photos from Plenty Benson. So those are the actual trees that he saw. And then he goes around, and he's like, what, what, what are these dead birds doing? And if you look close, that is the, uh, the, this 
pincer of a scorpion is holding on to the bird. The bird's already dead there, and it's getting fed on the scorpion. And this one, see, this one is being attacked by ants now that the ants are running all over it. The scorpion is still holding on to it and trying to feed as much as it can before the ants get it. Kind of like the uh, uh, cheetahs and the lions, right? The cheetahs have to eat fast before the lions take over. Okay, then of course there's these tarantula-like spiders, and some of them might eat birds, too. I think this is probably somewhat exaggerated. I think even the largest tarantulas mostly eat bugs. But certainly, people have seen this. There's no question that sometimes in the tropics, um, score, uh, tarantulas will eat, will eat birds, small birds. So that's a nice sort of, an, I can't find what the source this is. A friend of mine sent this to me, but uh, I don't know who drew that. It's clearly from the 1800s. And so th there's a group of tarantulas called bird-eating spiders, and they are among the world's largest spiders. So keep this number in mind, 85 grams is how big they are, which is, is quite well within bird range, right? A lot of birds are about that size or smaller. And so these are living in the neotropics, and they live in trees, so they, they stalk you know, birds. Um, I found one record of a, a North American tarantula species. It's not really a tarantula, but it's a relative of tarantula eating a snowy plover um, chick in, the, I think it was in California. So that's just one little, it's kind of a rare thing. It probably doesn't happen that often. Um, this is also probably not a super common thing. You may have seen these on, on the internet. I don't know if you've ever run these pictures. They're really making the rounds on the internet. This horrible spider that is, it, this is actually the largest web spinning spider in the world. Um, so these are sort of tropical groups of spiders. And they're not horrible at all. In fact, they can't bite you. They can't bite people. But occasionally a bird gets caught in their web and they'll actually feed on them. Probably most of the time the birds get away. But this is a chestnut-breasted mannequin, according to um, uh, Bob Howe, my colleague at, at Greenbrook. And so this is in Australia, tropical Australia, northern Australia. So Nephila is, is around the world, all around the tropics, the biggest web-spinning spider. And they do sometimes catch birds, they'll catch bats, they'll catch snakes, all different kinds. So there was a paper just recently that came out, birds caught in spider webs. And they, were, they were trying to synthesize all the different records that they had found. So this thing does happen, of course, you can imagine, especially with hummingbirds, right? They're very tiny, they're almost insect size, and so of course they're going to get caught in, in uh, <coughs> spider webs sometimes. Um, this one here I thought I'd just point, you, point out. No hummingbirds were harmed in the making of this talk. <laughs> <laughs> the person that took this photo said, well, we, we released the hummingbirds. <laughs> So anyway, they looked at almost 70 cases of this happening, birds getting caught in a spider web. Um, 54 bird species, 23 different families of birds. And of course, it's mostly small birds and large spiders, right? That's pretty much the only way it's gonna happen. The mean bird size was 11 grams. So mostly hummingbirds. Uh, remember, the tra tra that tarantula was 80 some grams, 85 grams, so it's a tiny little bird. So that 90% the, of the birds are below 15 grams. But the biggest one, they found a laughing dove, God, I don't know, 80 grams, so it's about the size of that tarantula. Um, and then the most common spider was that Nephila, this, this big golden silk spider, they call it. And all the orb we all of them were orb weavers to make these spiral webs, except for black widows. Black widows can also catch birds. Okay, so predation uh, of birds on spiders is of course much more. And this is really the, a really important reason why you should be interested in spiders, because they really are important foods for birds. Um, you know, we oftentimes say birds are insectivorous, but almost all of those insectivores are really also eat spiders, like insectus nidivorous, and they just put short and then insectivorous. Um, and some birds are definitely more, they focus more on spiders than others. There's not very many of them that, that really just eat spiders. I don't know if there's any birds that just totally turn up their nose at a bug and eat a spider, but some of them rely more on spiders than others. And, and I'll tell you one story about um, some spiders are seen to be nutritionally important to baby birds. So this is an interesting connection. This is probably my favorite story about birds and spiders. So this is a, this is a nice photo of my, my friend Don Buckle from Sask Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, the Lapland and Longsburg. This is not a spider. I thought this was a teachable moment. This is a daddy long legs, and they're not spiders. They're, they're arachnids. Anyway, they can also serve as bird food, obviously. This is something that's interesting to think about. Ecologists are thinking about spiders as a, a shunt for energy. Okay? 
from the microscopic world to the macroscopic world, basically. So let me walk you through that. Most of the time, birds participate in what ecologists call green food webs, where plants are you know, growing, and then herbivores eat the plants, and carnivores eat the herbivores, you know, your standard food web. So this is, this is what we usually think of, and so you know, the bird is, is going to be up here somewhere, probably, right? Maybe it's here. Um, but actually, most of the energy in an ecosystem ends up, most ecosystems end up in brown food webs. So the plant grows, and it doesn't get eaten, and then it dies, and it turns into detritus, and then detritivores eat the plant material, right? And this is actually a bigger source of energy. And, but, you know, sadly for us, it's like, well, the birds can't get at that, because they don't eat detritus, you know? It's just a bunch of microbes and, you know, spiders and stuff. Well, spiders are actually an important link between the, the brown and the green worlds, okay? So this is how it works, right? The plant produces detritus, detritivores eat that stuff, and spiders eat the detritivores, and then birds eat the spiders, right? The birds and salamanders and lizards and toads, all sorts of animals are eating the spiders. It's transferring that energy to the visible world of, of big animals. So spiders are important for that reason. Uh, spiders can be a threat, actually, to organisms because they can serve a, play a role in biological magnification of toxins, heavy metals. And so, you know, these, some of these pollutants, they, they can bioaccumulate, right? They maybe are fat-soluble, so instead of peeing out these poisons, they get accumulated in the body tissue, and then it moves up the food chain, because one bird has to eat a whole bunch of insects, right? Pounds of insects in its life, and it's getting all the toxins from all of those bugs. And so the bird oftentimes has a lot more mercury or PCBs or whatever in its body than, than the spiders do. And it turns out that, unfortunately, spiders have been implicated in, in bioaccumulation, especially of mercury, because mercury will accumulate in aquatic systems, right? And it settles down in sediments and so on. And the terrestrial organisms are mostly safe, except the aquatic organisms come out, like mosquitoes, they have come out and they've got mercury in them, and then the spiders catch the mosquitoes, and then the birds catch the spiders. And so it's transferring mercury from the aquatic system back into the terrestrial system. And there's one study that was just done in 2008, documenting this. And they were looking at three different wren species on the Shenandoah River in Virginia. This is one of them. This is the one that had the highest mercury levels, actually. This Carolina wren, cute little bird. And these are spider, uh, birds that really like to eat spiders. 20 or 30 percent of their diet was spiders. Um, and the spiders had a lot more mercury in them than like terrestrial caterpillars. Right? Not surprisingly, they're eating, you know, uh, midges and mosquitoes. And uh, the spider-eating wrens had higher mercury than the fish-eating kingfishers at the site, and, and twice as high as things that aren't eating aquatic food, you know, the owls and the woodpeckers. So there, it's clearly, you know, moving mercury from the aquatic to the terrestrial system. So that's an interesting relationship between the wrens and the birds. And then here we have a special case. These are the birds that I originally thought of when I was thinking about spiders and birds is small nectar feeders. And of course around here we're thinking of hummingbirds, right? They, they tend to rely heavily on spiders, partly because birds can't live on just sugar water, right? That's impossible. They have to have other materials, and in particular they need to have protein, and they get protein by eating, you know, insects and things. And a lot of these nectar birds seem to really like to eat spiders, that, that they, they sort of focus on spiders. The other thing that's interesting, and you may have heard about this, but Hummingbirds really focus on spider webs to help them construct their nests. A lot of times their, their webs are mainly made of spider web, and you have to collect a great deal of spider webbing to, to get them. So this is just another kind of nectar of this uh, bird that you find in the Australian region, a honey creeper. It's a really beautiful thing. It's called the red-legged one. I would have called it the incredible blue color. I'm not an ornithologist, so I wouldn't have even noticed the red legs. The red legs. It's blue. It's a blue animal. Um, so hummingbirds. They have some hummingbird nests. They have lichen and spider webs. So they're so cute. They're just so cute. This is just for scale, right? For the heat. You know? But I thought I'd tell you a story of a spider colleague of mine. He, he was in, south, in the southwest in Arizona, and there's all these... Um, uh, spider webs underneath this porch, right? And, and the hummingbirds would seem to visit the spider webs and they'd have this behavior they did. It's 
hit the spider web and they drop down. Hit the spider web and drop down like that. And what, what we think they were doing is they were trying to make the spider bail. That's what we call it. Arachnologists call it bailing. The spider's in its web. If you disturb its web, they jump out of the web and fall on the ground where you can't find them. So they're, they're bailing. So we think that the hummingbirds are inducing bailing and then they're flying down to intercept the spider as it was, as it was falling. So that's pretty cool behavior. It's not in a paper or anything, it's just an anecdotal observation. Keep your eye open for that. Maybe that's a thing. And then here's some sort of like hummingbirds, right? These are birds that are convergent with hummingbirds um, and they're called sunbirds. Um, this is a family, an uh, old world family of birds called the nectarians, right? They like drink nectar, nectar is. And I just thought they were really beautiful. Some of these are really, that's a good name, the regal sunbird. There's nothing wrong with that name. And I just found some stuff. They, they don't just eat spiders, they also eat insects, but apparently their nests are also woven with generous use of spider webs. So a lot of these small birds seem to, to favor spider webs. It's a really strong material, it's very light, but you have to be really small to collect enough they can take advantage of it. And then I had to feature the spider hunters. <laughs> Just a great name. Um, it's a type of sunbird. So they're also nectarias. But look at, the, they're in the genus Arachnothera, which means spider hunter. That's right. <laughs> so they actually, I was a little bit disappointed to find they don't just eat spiders, they eat a variety of other <laughs> but, um, but here's a quote from a, probably from the Wikipedia page, I don't know, but it says it's capable of extracting spiders from the center of their web, a tricky task, which kind of sounds like the hummingbird. It's more, so anyway, nice spider hunters. I didn't know there was any such thing as spider hunters before I started doing this talk. Okay, this is my favorite story about spiders and birds. It seems that spiders are important as food for maybe some, at least, baby passerby little songbirds. Um, and it has to do with this amino, one of the amino acids that are part of our bodies, taurine. Taurine is apparently really important for healthy brain development of baby humans, baby birds, all sorts of baby vertebrates, you know, maybe even baby spiders, I don't know. Um, spiders are enriched in taurine. They have 40 to 100 times more taurine than a similar weight caterpillar. Right? It has to do probably with them being predators instead of herbivores. So they're, they're, they're enriched in taurine. And it turns out that, as you might predict, for a little while, these, these blue tits here will, will sort of focus on spiders. And they will feed their babies mostly spiders for a few days. Apparently, it's right around the time when they're opening their eyes and starting to move around. Five-day-old blue tits are fed a higher proportion of spiders. Maybe it's a lot of work to find these spiders because the parents kind of give up after go back to just feeding them caterpillars and stuff. And so they were thinking, no, maybe it has to do with taurine. Well, here's some more evidence. A paper just came out here, this 2007 paper, and they experimentally fed blue tit chicks high taurine diets. And those babies took greater risks and you know, were better at learning how to move them around and stuff. So, so it's at least good evidence. It's not like we've proven that they have to have spiders, you know, but it seems like it may be on Baby bird development. So, kind of a cool story. Let me show you a really weird, this is probably the weirdest story I found that has to do with birds and spiders. And it's what I call a tritrophic interaction. That is three trophic levels. Okay? So you've got the bugs, and the bugs are eaten by the birds, and then the bird is eaten by the spider tailed horned viper. <laughs> pretty wild. It, it, it's kind of like a rattlesnake in that it's got this modified tail. But it, it shakes this tail around. It's not trying to warn you of anything. It doesn't make any noise. It, it, it moves it around in such a way that it looks like a bug. Or to me, it looks like a spider. Apparently the person that was describing these thought it looked like a spider too, right? The spider tail. I didn't name it. So it uses its tail as a lure to attract poison birds. Of course, it might not really be a spider mimic. It, it might just be an insect you know, mimic. But it's still pretty cool. It's a pretty interesting thing. This is in, in Iran, Western Iran. They, this, this spider, then, sorry, this snake has been described as new to science within the last decade. So it's, it's quite new. Um, this is where I first discovered it. 
was from this video I saw at the American Ratological Society. And let's see if I can get it to play. This shows the movement. Yeah, so that's the idea, is it's a lure, and it's trying to, like, hey, birds, come here, there's a spider over here. And then the bird lands, and then the snake strikes. Yeah. And of course, you might say, oh, you're just making that up, it's a just so story. But now it's been documented. So it's been, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but there's a YouTube video, and you can type in spider tailed horned viper. I think this is worth watching. I know it's going to take a couple minutes, but I think this is worth it. I know I'm over time now. I can't hear, but that's okay. It's kind of goofy narration, actually. <laughs> I'm not sure what, you know, what country this came from. This, this nature video. It's kind of weird. But... Is the Anybody know what the bird is? He's called an insectivore bird. This is what I would call this. So it says, it says the bird is promptly attacking insects. So yeah, you see the little insect there. It looks like a spider, actually. Yeah. This is amazing footage. <laughs> <laughs> this does show bird mortality, so warning. If, if this is going to shock you, turn look, look away. <laughs> so there's the bird eating caterpillar. It's a different one. There's an insect bird. Okay, watch this. There's the spider one. Oh. Did you see that? It landed on the snake's head, and then it attacked. It didn't even know it was landing on snake's head. I think they're going to show it one more time. I don't know if you want to see that. <laughs> it's horrible, yes, but isn't that amazing? That's an amazing interaction. That, this is the first time this has ever been filmed. This is new science. Well, snakes were harmed in the making of that video. <laughs> the snakes, but they don't say anything about the bird. Lands and then it tries to get it. Yeah. 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 Isn't that incredible? So that was that was pretty amazing, but we have to keep in mind why spiders and birds really have a connection. And the connection that they really share more than anything else is that they live in the same habitats. Right? And so we, if we want to have one, we're going to have the other, and we need these habitats. So, um, so this is just what I want to say. They they really depend on the same habitat type. It's just like birds, where if you go to different habitats, you find different spider species. Some spiders are only found in very specific habitats, right? It's the very same kind of thing. It's not just like, oh yeah, the same ones that live in my house are, you know, that's not the way it works. It's just like birds. And, and then another thing I thought I'd leave you with is that when you have habitats that have high spider diversity, they almost always have high bird diversity and vice versa. They, they like the same sort of things. They respond to the same sort of things with diversity. And so something like this, you know, this beautiful, um, you know, northern wetland is going to be, you know, you probably look at that and say, there, I can just imagine which birds I can find there, you know, the list of birds that you find. Well, I look at that, and I can say the same thing about spiders. I, I know certain spiders that you can only find there. You know, you can only find saddle atlas marks eye there and nowhere else. So, you know, we really appreciate nature in a very similar way. It's kind of microscopic for, for spiders and macro. All right, so I think that's all I've got. I'm going to leave you with beautiful... Spider and bird, heart-shaped spider there, and then this is the um, the resplendent kestrel. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. All right, uh, and let me know if you have spider stories, spider bird stories. Yeah. Thank you.
ammonia pyramid, and each layer is supposed yeah. to be ten percent of, uh, okay. of the layer before. Sure. And I can remember when we used to go out in field trips with sweep nets, and uh, mm -hmm. um, we get everything these canvas the bags, and, and we uh, sort them out after stunning them or killing them, and yeah. weigh them. Still we always today. came up with way more spiders than what was predicted. Yes. And the only explanation I could ever you know, think of is the fact that. Uh, over a course of a year, it was all right, but they just simply didn't eat that much. That's right. That's exactly right. I think we still see the same thing today where, you know, like half of the catch is spiders and half of them is the insects that spiders are supposed to eat. And it's sort of like this paradox, yeah, it just but exactly what you said, I think it's they're, it wasn't what they're it, hunger resistant. Yeah. They're not really that efficient. They'll go days without eating. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very interesting uh, observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, people do. Um, I certainly have seen a lot in, in southeastern Asia, people will actually collect fairly significant portions of tarantulas and like roast them on fires and stuff or stir fry them. Yeah, I, I've never heard that's that, but that's a great follow-up question. I, I bet we get enough taurine in our diet, you know, we're eating eggs and breast milk and you know, all these things that babies get, so they probably don't. But it is interesting, there are some cultural cases of bug eating that seem to have to do with nutrition. And one in particular that I'm fascinated with is that in, in places in Mexico that are a long way away from the ocean, a lot of times people are iodine deficient and, and they get goiters and they crave um, these stink bugs. And they eat stink bugs. And these stink bugs are very high in iodine. There you go. Human bug in so sometimes people make pizzas nowadays. <laughs> Thanks, uh, I think it's a mite that I've seen in wild water, a bright red swimming. Uh, yes. Why is it bright red? Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, those are water mites. And, and it's probably, I don't know this for a fact, but it's probably bright red. Most mites that are bright red are really, really bad tasting. And so they're basically warning large visual predators. Like, you don't want the red one. The red one's going to make so they'll eat a water mite and they'll get sick and they're like, all I know is don't eat this red. They learn really fast. So I think that's what it is. It's like warning coloration. But it's because of the sequester of something you have to use in the body. Yeah. There, there was these um, little velvet mites that I used to catch. Well, they're actually huge velvet mites that we used to catch in the desert. I'm from New Mexico. And they come out in like one day, right after a thunderstorm. They all come out. They live underground and they eat termite eggs. Okay? But one day of the year, they come out and they mate on the desert. And um, I picked some of those up and I tried to feed it to a spider. And it was the very same thing. This jumping spider jumped on this mite, ah, and then it went, <laughs> and spit it out. And then it would never touch the red mite again. It must have really tasted. I didn't have the courage to. Stop it. I was afraid to be like the first, you know, first recorded case of mite fatality. I didn't want to be that guy. My wife and I were in the Galapagos, and we were walking along a trail, and we came to a, a huge spider web. And so to get through, uh, we just tore it down. Yeah, sure. And we continued uh, on our hike, and came back, it wasn't more than an hour, and the darn thing was completely rebuilt. Wow. I could not believe it. The spider was three or four inches, yeah. you know. It may well have been that long. Uh, that to me was incredible that they could redo this whole web in such a short time. Yeah, that actually surprises me too. Um, they, they generally, if you wreck their webs down, I always tell people, you kind of ruined their day. Like, you haven't ruined their life. Because yeah. most of these spiders actually take their webs down every day or every night, depending on whether it's daytime or nighttime. Oh, wow. And the web spinning spiders will actually ball up the web and then eat it. Because it's got proteins in that silk, and they have enzymes to, to take it, you know, to break it down again, recycle the silk. So that's the usual among web spinning spiders. So it's usually just once a day, and usually if you wreck it down when they're foraging, they just go and hide and like you know, and wait. You know, like I, 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 I noticed really that about webs. If you knock them down, they get them built up very fast. Yeah, that's right. So they, they'll, they'll take them down whether you knock it down or not. So don't feel too bad when you <laughs> knock a spider web down in the forest. It's like, like I said, you ruined their day. Yeah. Um, I thought I read a statistic recently of, that a spider makes web so long 
to its lifetime that goes around the world, or if you, if you measured it that right? Or? Um, I've heard a different statistic, and it's if you got a golf ball's worth of spider silk, and you spun it out as thin as a spider would go, it would go around the world. Okay. I don't think that most spiders would make that much. Okay. But, but it is a, a really amazing. Wow, the yeah. stuff is almost as strong as steel, but way more flexible than steel. And, and people have said that if you could make a t-shirt out of spider silk, which actually you could, it would be like a Kevlar vest. It would wow. be a bulletproof mm -hmm. vest. Wow. That's pretty impressive. Somebody actually built a dress out of spider silk. Did anyone see that? It's a beautiful yellow color, uh, but it, it took years and years of getting those golden silk spiders, milking them for the silk, and this thing cost something like seven million dollars. <laughs> beautiful, <laughs> and kind of out of our price range. Um, the other thing I want to mention is two of my favorite arachnids are the uh, pseudo scorpions and the uh, jumping spiders because they seem to have little personality. They just, yeah. they just respond. The other thing I wanted to ask is when you saw, talked about after a volcanic explosion and the first invaders are spiders. Now, I always thought spiders were predators that ate juices or sucked juices and stuff like that. Yeah. But if they're the first organism on the volcanic rock, are they eating uh, detritus? That the spider has the ability to break down the hard exoskeletons or whatever? Yeah. No, I'll answer that question first. No, they. They're among the first colonists. There's also other spiders, so there's other spiders to so eat. And then them. there's other insects that also will land, flies and things like that. So, they're so, so there is food for them to eat, but they, don't, they won't eat detritus. Some, de some daddy long legs can eat detritus, they can eat solid food. But the spiders cannot do that. Occasionally a spider will scavenge on a dead insect if it's really hungry, but it's got to eat, you know, it can't eat detritus. No. That's right, they, they kind of have to liquefy their diet. I don't, I don't know of any spider that eats detritus. Um, I was going to say something interesting about how smart they are, though. They're not as smart as we are, because, and it's mostly because they're so small, right? There's just not room for very many neurons to be in their bodies. But they really try hard. Some of those jumping spiders, their brains are so large, they're much larger than ours for the size of the body, their brains actually go into their legs. So there's more space <laughs> for one out of space. So they've got brains down in their legs. So that's pretty impressive. They still use spiders. Yes. Could you explain uh, how the spiders you talked about ballooning? Uh huh. I, 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 how that works? Yeah. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? Because we couldn't do that no matter what. There's no way you could do that. But it's, it has to do with being incredibly tiny. You have to be smaller than like five milligrams or something, which is just about maybe three millimeter long spider. Those are the only ones that can balloon. And when you're that size, you put out a very thin silk line, and that silk is so thin that if you get about a meter of it, or maybe even a half a meter of it, 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 it will can get lifted up by rising air currents. And it just, just the rising air, as you know, it's, it's the warm air rises, so it just goes up. And, and it, it has enough lift that it can lift, you know, three milligrams. So it just get pulled up into the, and so most of the time they just go a couple meters, right? Most spiders will balloon and they'll go a couple meters. A few of them will go 100 meters. One every million of them will go a mile. And one of every billion of them will go a thousand miles. Yeah. So every once in a while they get caught up in the wind, they can't get down. A lot of times they find them up in airplanes with nets. They'll catch some spiders way up there, and a lot of times they're dead. They, they couldn't get down. They just dry up and die. But this is a way for them to kind of get to all these new places. You know, so it's funny, it's expensive, it's kind of cruel. You know, they can't control where they're going. Yeah. There's an important uh, spider-human relationship during World War II. The, uh, uh, the uh, black widow spider web was used to make bomb sites. Oh, yes. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I have. Yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome cultural connection. And it was, there was nothing else that could be that straight and yeah. thin. Nowadays, of course, you can make microfibers that are just as good. But yeah, that's absolutely right. I always wondered. Who is harvesting the web? <laughs> <laughs> That's, I bet they had women doing that. That's a really <laughs> delicate work. You've got to have very small hands to make those sites. That's awesome. All right, well, thanks so much for your Thank attention. You.